modern world where governments use the term pacification, when what they really mean is gunning down villages of innocent people. We live in a world where governments use the word collateral damage, when they're actually describing a 10-year-old boy's body parts being screwed apart in a playground. In light of Abu Dhabi, there are horrific abuses that governments have committed against prisoners. In light of Afghani citizens being killed by American soldiers. In light of the fact that the government is hiding all these things to us and is not providing us the necessary information, we think you must absolutely support hacktivists using the necessary tools to get accountability on that government. For that reason, Mr. Speaker, we're very proud to propose that this House believes that hacktivism is a legitimate tool for political protest. So what I'm going to do for you today First, then, I'm going to define the terms for you. Then I'm going to move in some uh, modeling. But before that, I'm going to go into some burdens and mind, like tell you what my arguments are going to be in this round. So first of all, in terms of burdens, we're actually going to outweigh some uh, criteria for you in today's debate. The first criteria, we're going to claim that this needs to be effective. What we mean so, by effective, sure. Why do you think that accountability can be sacrificed for the lives of innocent people? What we're going to tell you is that in the vast majority of circumstances, hacktivism doesn't cause real deaths and doesn't have a real human cost. We say that in the vast majority of circumstances, hacktivism is a way that you get around the human cost that comes from using other forms of protest, which oftentimes causes real people to die. We say hacktivism so, is far more legitimate. No, thank you. So, first criteria, we're going to tell you this is effective. And this is important because there's no point in starting a protest if it doesn't yield results. Second of all, we're going to show you that this is actually a justifiable measure because we think that you actually need to show that the effects you create are proportional to a laws broken and the amount of damage that has caused to society. And lastly, we're going to show you that makes the protest better. So, what are we actually talking about in today's debate? First of all, we're going to show you, or first of all, we're talking about this house as in Western liberal democracies. We think that there, in other states there's a problem censorship so this information doesn't get out. But furthermore, we see that hacktivism is particularly important in Western liberal democracies where there are, where this is the best form of accountability for many of these governments. Second of all, in terms of talking about hacktivism, we're just talking about hacking for a political cause to bring attention, uh, for a political reason to bring attention to a cause. We think that the majority of time, this means we're hacking into government databases, exposing different things. We think that this oftentimes Point. Means showing that child pornography forums should be penetrated and that the government needs to act. I think like those kinds of uh, those kinds of actions are also legitimate. And lastly, when we're talking about tool, we're saying that this is one of the many parts of a process of a political so, process, and that this is a necessary part of that process and makes those protests better. Three different arguments that we're going to present to you on our side of the house. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the right to hack, which is a principled analysis of why we have this right. Secondly, I'm going to talk about effectiveness and why this is actually an effective form of political protest. And lastly, Josh is going to tell you about social mobilization and how this will increase social mobilization. Point. Moving to my first argument, I'm going to talk about the right to hack. First sub point, we say that fundamentally that the role of the government is to serve the will of the people. We say that the reason that we hold these kinds of governments and have these kinds of elections is in order to ensure that the will of the people is actually met in the majority of circumstances. However, we say in the status quo there's a vast problem, where governments decide not to disclose information, where governments decide that it's appropriate to lie and deceive the general public in order to achieve their aims and their goals without consulting the people. Point. We think this is absolutely damaging because we think a democracy is only legitimate and only has integrity when we know what is happening so we can keep that government accountable. We don't know those basic facts, we think there is no accountability, and we think if the government is allowed to skirt the rules sometimes and decides when it can skirt the rules, it can make the most atrocious and awful decisions in human history. We see that the American government often does this. We saw in WikiLeaks that the American government was in fact abusing Point. innocent Afghani citizens who never did anything to harm anyone else, who were just there or were killed for absolutely no reason. So Mr. Speaker, how does this actually relate to hacktivism in particular? We tell you that hacktivism is one of the only means to excuse these abuses or create publicity. That there's no other mean because you don't know about the fact that this is happening. Mr. Speaker, you can't have a violent, or you can't have a protest where you walk down the streets saying that the government did something wrong, but you don't even know what the government did in the first place. We think that hacktivism is a necessary tool because these kind of, this kind of information is held secret in secret databases which are never revealed to the public and that absolutely no one knows about. We say in those kinds of circumstances, you need hacktivism to actually make sure that people understand that these kinds Point. of atrocious practices are actually happening. We say that in these kinds of circumstances, hacktivists will actually expose these kinds of secrets, allow the public to make a collective decision on whether or not this is right or legitimate. Because we ultimately stress that hacktivists aren't making a decision for themselves, they're only expressing their own will, meaning that they're informing the public, allowing the public to recognize the fact so. that there are problems, and allowing them to come to their own conclusions. We think that's the best form of accountability, we think that's the kind of accountability that you get on our side of the house. 
But second sub point we tell you is that this is also something which affects us, right? Because we think in many circumstances, hacktivism is also done to expose that the government isn't providing services properly. So for example, if you hack into the White House, or if you hack into other governmental websites that have your necessary information, expose the fact that these are vulnerable, but never take any kind of information, as is what happens oftentimes with hacktivism, it tells the government that they need to actually step it up and improve security in those areas. I think that's absolutely crucial because these are the lives of real people at hand. These are the lives of average citizens, and yet they have the right to know if these things are vulnerable in order to make better decisions for themselves, to get better outcomes for themselves. I think ultimately you maintain the role of democracy Point. and justify that on our side of the house. Second argument, moving to talking about effectiveness. First sub-point, I'm going to talk about why this produces the most amount of awareness with the least amount of violence. First of all, we think that's important to recognize the fact that this is a platform of massive mobilization, so, right? So I just going to talk to you about this a little bit more. We'd say, in general, this is the best way of getting your message out there, because we think it happens immediately. And I don't need to be in the same room as you, Mr. Speaker, to let you know that this awful, atrocious practice is happening. This is something that happens on the internet, and massive amount of people can do it at one time, and can be viewed by anyone at one time. We say that this is really beneficial for getting people to actually know about it and foster some kind of accountability. But further, we'd say that this allows uh, people to use hacktivism as a form of political protest instead of other types of more violent forms of political protest. I mean, when you see riots happening in London, we see different actions happening, which oftentimes come from these kind of innocent protests, which turn bad. You actually have a means out because right. you allow political protesters to use different forms of political protest in order to garner that kind of accountability and garner that amount of awareness. I think mean, that's beneficial because you get less lives lost, but more amount of people being held accountable in the government. So, second sub point, I'm going to talk about why this actually allows people to hack appropriately. We think that you need some degree of anonymity in order to be able to make these kinds of decisions to feel like you can actually express these kinds of decisions. We say that if you're not, if you're not anonymous, then you don't feel free to make these kinds of decisions because you feel that the government is going to come to you and rescue you. I think that's fundamentally harmful because you don't make the necessary decisions and the necessary sacrifices to help the greater good and society at large. You need the opportunity to feel anonymous in order to make these kinds of decisions. But we think that hacktivism is particularly unique because it allows for a degree of accountability that makes it so that you don't have outrageous decisions. Three different lines of analysis. First of all, we think before the fact hacktivists actually have large communities. So if you give me an example of anonymous, they actually have a forum where they post on it and have massive debates about the action that they're going to take beforehand. So we think this is a kind of accountability that makes sure that they don't make poor decisions before the fact. But we also say that there's legal repercussions if you are found out in some circumstances, but isn't so often enough and doesn't happen at a high enough uh, circumstance that you're actually going to feel deterred in an absolute <coughs> sense, you're just going to be more reasonable. Lastly, we think other hackers can hold you accountable. So if you make a poor choice in exposing information, other hackers reveal your identity by hacking into where you came from, and this bit essentially allows for you to be held accountable by other hackers. Because we think government has abuses, because we think that they don't disclose enough information, and because we think hackers are the most effective and thus the most accountable form of political protest, we're very, very proud to propose. <laughs> And I would like to welcome the opening speaker of the opposition side to introduce their case. The sort of activism we are talking about is not just simple information sharing and file sharing. The sort of activism we are talking about is active acts which purposely distribute public and social services. For example, revealing credit card information online by anonymous hack PSN, such as for example taking down the emergency call services of medical facilities in Estonia. We cannot allow side proposition to give us this very innocuous version of hacktivism as only information sharing, as by doing so, then losing out on the wide, uh, the wide spectrum of hacktivism in status quo. But more importantly, right, side proposition hasn't really proved to us that burden of proof in this debate. 
They have to prove to us that there's something so urgent and specific to the point where certain political protests cannot survive without hacktivism. That there's something so inherently different about hacktivism as compared to other political protest movements. What we observed in the first speaker was a generic laundry list as to why hacktivist movements are good, not why other movements are on the comparative bad. On this ground alone, we tell you that the analysis falls. But back to that point of contention, right? The first point, the first speaker's first substantive about the right to have. The first thing they told us was that governments should always disclose information. Hang on, democracy is not always about absolute information, right? Like for example, citizens make certain choices such as voting in governments, but citizens don't decide, for example, foreign policy, interest rates, financial policy, and military deployments. The reason is why, this, the reason as to why is because civilians can make certain decisions better, such as for example, electing who they think the rep, who they think represents them, but they cannot make decisions that require a lot of sensitive information and technical expertise, such as deciding military deployments on that point alone, we don't think that government has the incentive to, uh, to disclose this information as, as absolutely as they did so. Then they brought to us this very fallacious point about how there's a, there's a sort of systemic abuse within the current status quo, where like for example, that, for, where, for example the US government covers up drone strikes. Hang on, this is a problem solution mismatch, as the way to control this is through better intra-governmental regulations, such as for example, drone reforms carried out by the Obama administrations, such as for example, reforms by the NSA also carried out by the Obama, uh, Obama administrations. We tell that the sort of checks and balances they want to talk about to prevent this uh, systemic spread of abuses is simply that the solution to do so is simply not to allow activism in the very first place. The last thing they brought to us was how activism somehow provides information on the ground. Hang on, firstly, that's not true because they disrupt, because even though part of it might involve getting information, they're often motivated to do much more. Why? Because they can, because they're behind a computer screen where they cannot be held accountable at all. Hence, this false characterization of providing information to the ground simply does not work. Moreover, we tell that the other methods as well. For example, the favorite example, WikiLeaks, was not provided by hackers, but was provided by informants within the various services within the Department of Defense. We tell that the other methods of distributing information in the very first case. Lastly, they have not brought to us this comparative. They want to explain the comparative as to how the lives lost through hacktivism is anyway better than the lives saved on their side. On the comparative, they have just asserted that lives are saved on their side without providing any concrete explanation as to why this is the case. The only thing they forwarded to us is this notion about how government, governments, uh, government systems are better regulated if we allow hacktivists to hack their networks. Hang on, there are much better ways of doing this rather than allowing hackers to run free within your social and medical services and disrupting the country as it is. We don't think that this is a legitimate point. Second point of contention, is this really effective? The first thing they brought to us was about mobilization. But hang on, the summary typing in keystrokes behind a computer screen really mobilize a lot of people? No, as my second speaker will argue, it's the visceral form of people on the ground which is the sort of thing which galvanizes people in the very first place. Because the fact of the matter is that a discussion on an online forum is, is, it comes nowhere close, no thank you sir, to galvanizing public support as real on the ground political protests with people wearing, with people wearing banners on main streets. We tell you that this is not the case. Moreover, even if you were to concede the fact that under their paradigm, political protests can still go on, we tell that on their side, such movements won't have much backing. Why is this so? This is because hacktivism leads to concrete harms. Hacktivism leads to the distribution of social and medical services, and it's precisely because of that reason alone, the political movement on their side simply will not happen because the civilian who is harmed by hacks simply will not do so. The only thing they retreated to was hackers can counterbalance other hackers. Hang on, hacking is by very, it's by very nature anonymous, hence a hacker from, Pen from Pennsylvania cannot tell if the other hacker was from Idaho, from Idaho or Hawaii. Even if we tell that this is, even if we tell that this was the case, we tell that the hacker will not compromise on another hacker because quite simply they will be compromising their movement because they will see the fact that not even hackers are loyal to their other forms. We tell that this is not the case at all. And the last one, and the only form of analysis they finally provided was the fact that online discussion forums somehow form, somehow form the nucleus of large centralized organizations. Hang on guys, online discussion boards on 4chan and Reddit are not really the nucleus of organizations that for example promote systemic political goals, that for example call for a cause that's important to a large number of people, which are of this ground rule, the analysis is simply false. So what will I be bringing to you in that constructive matter for the house today? I'll be proving as to how hacktivists are by the very nature anonymous and hence are systemically destructive. But my second speaker will talk to you all about how it dehumanizes protests and hence dilutes the effectiveness of protests in the very first place. So under the first substantive right of anonymity, 
premise of my argument is that hacktivism is fundamentally anonymous. Why is this so? This is the case functionally because it, comprises, because it consists of unnamed people behind a computer screen. People are just not trackable, people are not traceable. But moreover, we tell you that there's an incentive to remain anonymous. As if you remain anonymous, you're immune to prosecution. The government cannot do anything to you at all. And hackers, are, hold on a moment sir, are more likely to remain anonymous. Yes. We tell you first of all that hackers are a tight in the community, but such of all hackers can crack into encryption. That's how you get this kind of natural organic accountability which holds these hackers accountable to a certain degree, but allow them to not to be risk averse. Hold on a minute, so you haven't systemically proven how harming innocent lives on the ground when Estonia's medical services get disrupted is the better way of, of, of carrying out a check and balance on the government as opposed to congressional inquiries on our side. For example, through peaceful reforms by people on the ground. This is a comparative you have not proven and you challenge your next speaker to come up and give the comparative for you. So what does it mean that when such organizations are anonymous? We tell them not beholden, they're not accountable to a larger other group. By a larger other group, we're not being discussion forums on Reddit. We are telling about organizations which are centrally organized, which have a clear aim in mind by people on the ground. Hence, they're often beholden to very vague ideas such as anti-capitalism, such as anti-West or pro-West, which are very blanket terms which often don't lead to anything specific. So what does this mean, right? This leads to two main problems. Firstly, that because there's no trend as the anonymous, hacktivists have no boundaries. On the comparative, normal protests have very real physical boundaries as there's a threat to their body, as there's a, as there's a visceral threat to their bodily harms. As for example, if they were to burn down a medical facility for protesting, they'll be prosecuted under the fair rule of law in a Western liberal democracy. On the comparative, for hacktivists, there's no boundaries, there's no checks and balances, and as there's every incentive to be as heinous as possible, as to them, doing so is just another couple of keystrokes on a keyboard. This is where we give you the examples of our anonymous hacking the PSN and posting credit card details of 200,000 people to be open to everybody online. Secondly, more importantly, right, normal political processes are constructive, are constructive in nature and they often aim to reform the system. This is because they derive the legitimacy from the people as the ranks of protests on the ground are, are made up of these very people themselves. This is why, for example, normal protests allow for ambulances to drive through in the event there's a medical emergency. This is why there's always an angle to protest on the ground. But on the other hand, hacktivism is a destructive force because they don't derive legitimacy from the public. Hence, they can do whatever they want and in fact, they can be even more destructive because being destructive is far more easier than being constructive because it's, it's just inputting several years of code. What does this mean? This means, for example, environmental activists are melting down nuclear reactors because they can. It leads to, for example, people hacking the Department of Defense and crashing radar facilities. All the reasons are very important. for the speech and I would like to welcome the second speaker on the government side to further expand on their rights. So we have a side of opposition and every single case study and example that they gave you and all of their analysis was directed to the minority of cases where this information already exists. What we tell in our side of the house is we need to get that information in the first place. And sometimes we're willing to break those boundaries in order to have access to it. And once we have that access, that's when we decide what is illegal and not illegal to do. This debate is not about what we do with the hacked information, but the act of hacking in and of itself. That's what we're trying to prove to you and justify, justify it on our side of the house. As the second speaker for side proposition, I'll do a few things. First off, I'll refute everything they told you. Second off, I'll refute Jason's points, or sorry, Bill Jason's points, which I think still stand. And finally, I'll get into constructive, entitled social mobility. Okay, so first off, some refutation. The first major theme I want to look at this under on is what is hacktivism and what are burdens? So essentially, they told you.
do hacktivism is when like these hackers are going in for credit card information, people's health and security issues. That's absolutely wrong because first off, there's no political purpose to that, and second off, that's for their own self-interest. That is not hacktivism. We're not defending that on our side of the house. Point. But second off, they told you that our burdens is to prove that first off, this is the best form of a, like a best tool, and second off, that um, what we have to prove what they do with that information. Absolutely not true. We have to say that this is legitimate, not compared to other forms. And second off, we have to prove to you that it's the act of hacking in and of itself, not what they do with that information. This is a tool to start the protest, not what happens later on in that protest. Their burdens are completely wrong. Okay. The next thing I want to look under this is essentially anonymity, because they talk to you a lot about anonymity and accountability. Essentially, what I told you is that they didn't engage with any analysis that, J that Jason gave you. He gave you nuanced analysis about, one, there's a community that first off checks what goes on. Second off, you are held legally accountable by the law. There are serious punishments for it. And third off, we, the hackers actually trust your information and they type, like they scrutinize it. They haven't told you about, like, uh, respond to those things. But furthermore, we told you that even if there is no community, there's still benefits. They never responded Point. to the idea that, like, simply from the fact that we hack into it shows that there's a flaw, that there's a weakness that needs to be solved. Why is that a bad thing? They haven't told you. The next thing that they talked about was this idea of, like, boundaries and how far are people willing to go. This is the next thing I want to look under this on. First off, if you're afraid of getting caught, you're never going to do it in the first place. We think it's important for people to have the incentive to actually try. But second off, those enforcement mechanisms and accountability still apply. So you still want to get in there, but there's still accountability. Then they gave you this idea of like how they're just going to be even more destructive. We don't disagree. I'm going to talk about this more in my point. But generally, less people are likely to join a movement if they think it's being super yeah. destructive and super like uh, if it's going way beyond its boundaries. When we tell you that if they start doing things like supporting violence and just hacking into people's mm. privacy, you won't want to join that movement. So if their incentive is to get more people to join yeah. their cause, it is less likely they're going to be so destructive. They'll only go up to a certain point because they want people to think that they're moderate. If they're extremists, people just won't join them. Okay. Now I'm going to go on to rebuilding Jason's points, although we don't think that they fully expanded on all of these subjects. So first off, Jason talked to you about the right to hack. Essentially, first off, I told you it's not about the absolute information. It's uh, there are things that we allow uh, like the government to do, like monitor foreign policy. First off, we think that in a lot of cases people like are upset. But in the cases that they are, there is probably something outrageous going on. We took the example of Afghanistan. There was something obviously going on. So we think that in a lot of cases where people pick up on it, it is because there's a serious issue. But second off, even if there isn't, if people are so upset about your foreign policy decision, most of that actually affects the people. You need the cooperation of the people to pass those decisions. So you need the support of the people on your side. So whether or not you like it, at some point you're going to have to disclose that information because otherwise people just simply won't cooperate with you. It's going to be ineffective. Then they responded to his point about how there are other methods, like we just try government regulations. Mr. Speaker, in order to put in place government regulations, we first off need to know what needs government regulations. We didn't know about the whole privacy scandal in the US until it came out. Once it came out, we were able to put in enforcement mechanisms and we were able to keep the government accountable. We need to know what is wrong first Man. before we can solve the problem, sure. The privacy scandal that you talk about was reviewed by informants and whistleblowers rather than hacktivists because, quite frankly, informants re re review the information in a matter that's not destructive. It's actually not true. We think inherently on your side conceded this. Hacking is something that people do to create with scr scrutiny. You want to know where the information is coming from, so you're likely to discuss it to debate it, simply because you want to know if it's objective or if it's not. We think that when you have that sort of discussion, it treats the legitimacy of the issue as a serious cause for concern. Finally, one thing I want to go on with because it's kind of been bothering our side is that they attacked our analysis on about Anonymous, a specific hacking group. We tell you that they're flawed. Anonymous does have a community and they do talk about social and political reasons. They've had lots of different scenarios and they do try and have to plan out these situations before they go on. Anonymous is an example for our side of the house, not theirs. Yeah. So now I'm going to move on to my constructive argument about social mobility. What we're going to prove to you is that social mobility is necessary for successful protest and second off, this increases social mobility. Okay. So first off, why is social mobility such having more people good for a protest? We would tell you that it's just generally more effective. We think that the government is more likely to pay attention to a protest if lots of people are in it. We think the government has an incentive to stay in power, most basically. We think that means that they have a like they have a concern for what the majority of people think. If lots of people are protesting and saying we're not happy with what you're doing, they are forced to look at what those people are saying rather than just a few. Ultimately, think if we want the government to take a to this and to have some sort of solutions, we need to get attention on. Okay. So why does this lead to more social mobilization which we prove to is a good thing? Three main reasons. 
First off, technology is a medium. Jason talked to this a bit more. We think the technology just tends to go viral. Like everybody can see it, we can spread it, people can spread the news. We think the impact of that is that more people find out. The first step is spreading awareness. Once people find out about it, they can choose whether or not it's legitimate or not. They can choose whether or not they want to join that protest. But we want to give people that choice in the first place. If they don't find out about it, they can't make up their minds about whether it's right or wrong. Second off, why does it lead to mobilization? When you release things that are fine through happy, uh, found through hacking, you're presenting information to the world. So we think this is objective, not subjective information. It's information that you can prove or disprove and discuss, and you're proving that it can be done. So for example, in all the examples that they gave you about violence, essentially what happens in those examples is that there are people that are pointing fingers at the government and saying, we don't like what they're doing. But those are all emotional things that people might not necessarily agree with. However, when you show them a piece of paper with the facts on it and traces, people are more likely to identify with those things. But second off, they continue to this. Hacking is generally seen as suspicious. You want to verify that information. You want to check onto it yourself. So even if you don't have a community of hackers involved, once it spread, spreads, people will want to do so. They have the incentive to do so. This is good for social mobility because people are more likely to listen to and treat objective and testable information than people making subjective and biased claims. And the third reason something that's very important is that hacktivism doesn't physically hurt people. Once again, this is a response to their thing about how it's going to get out of control. Many individuals are more likely to join a movement that is seen as peaceful. Why is this the case? They don't want to feel morally guilty. Man. You don't want to be associated with a group that is killing people, hurting people, doing things like maiming your privacy. So ultimately, if the incentives of these hackers is to get more people involved in a movement, they're going to try and be moderate, but still get the point out there, because they want people to join their cause. Ultimately, more people are just simply likelier to join a movement if they feel like it isn't doing too much harm. They're willing to make that cost-benefit analysis. So ultimately, we give you once again this example of anonymous because we really want to tell you that, is it, that it is successful. The reason we're just discussing it today is because we know of its initiatives. So Jason talks a bit about like child pornography and their idea about how they talk about political institutions. And this is a perfect example because the way anonymous works is first off, they discuss what sorts of issues they're going to be targeting. Second off, they discuss the process for following up on those issues. And finally, they discuss how are they going to release this into the, into the public eye. So there's accountability, there's discussion on every single step of the way. And because they do so, because we know that they're relatively moderate, we're more likely to buy into what they're doing. And it's a good thing, it's better to have people on your side. So what do we stand for in our studies? First off, we stand for hacktivism that is politically motivated and has a good reason to do so. We stand for uh, hacktivism that people can actually judge on their own merits. But second off, we stand for people being able to take that risk to decide what is justice, what is not, we think it's beneficial for everyone. We're extremely proud to propose. much for the speech and I would like to welcome the second speaker on the opposition side to further expand on their case. Imagine a world where the only answer to political and social causes is control out delete. We don't stand for that world. Let's first point out that they have never given an example of true hacktivism on their side. Why? Because it doesn't exist under status quo. The one screaming example that they had was Wikileaks. Guess what? Wikileaks relies on informants that do not hack, ladies and gentlemen. So let's move on to their arguments themselves. First, on the right to hack, and second, is hack hacking effective? So first, on the right to hack. They first retreated in their second speaker by saying, we can find out whether something is illegal or illegal after a hack. Guys, that's not how the justice system works. You don't tell a person you can do this and then you'll figure out whether you're legal or, uh, or you'll do this illegally afterwards. That's not how our current and Western liberal democracies work. This doesn't, this simply doesn't hold true to reality. So what's their argument? First, hackers keep your government accountable. First, this sounds like the job of media journal journalism and informants. It's not unique to their side. Furthermore, media journalism works better because it's regulated by profit motive and it's, up and it's appeal to consumers. That's why it's better. So what information did WikiLeaks leak, ladies and gentlemen? First, troop deployment. This sounds kind of dangerous to me. Second, drone strike codes. This also sounds kind of dangerous to me, ladies and gentlemen. The point is, 
WikiLeaks leaks information that threatens our national security in any country around the world. That's why we do not we do not condone WikiLeaks, ladies and gentlemen, because they ultimately the information that's dangerous. Imagine if a terrorist group got our hands on our drones and ultimately used the drone codes from WikiLeaks to strike at the heart of America. We don't want that to happen, ladies and gentlemen. But then it was that, well, the problem here is that governments don't disclose information and hacktivism exposes this information. We already told you that the majority of information that hacktivism exposes are things that are dangerous for, pub for the public to know. But even if the government doesn't disclose information, they do so with very good reasons. Which is the reason why we place our trust in democratically elected governments in the first place. Julian Assange's WikiLeaks almost started a war between Turkey and the USA. Is that the sort of thing that the other side condones? We do not accept that. Then they told us that, ladies and gentlemen, that um, ultimately this means that uh, there will be more robust government systems because governments will try to stop hacks, ladies and gentlemen. Guys, the fact that they, they are able to hack into your system in the first place means, ladies and gentlemen, that there's some information that's already out there in the public that we don't want to have. More importantly, governments have multi-billion dollar defense agencies that serve specifically to protect government websites. So what are the most likely targets for hacktivists? They are civilian websites, like hospitals, ladies and gentlemen. For example, when Anonymous tried to hack into my country's Ministry of Social and Family Affairs, they hacked into our school's website instead. Does that sound, ladies and gentlemen, like, like they, had, they had correct, legitimate social causes? No. But, but then they told us one more thing, right? They told us that, well, ultimately it's okay to do these things. Because ultimately, it's somehow just. Ladies and gentlemen, is it justified to rob a bank in real life? No, it's not. So why is it justified to rob a bank just because you're on the internet? We don't see a link on their side. But then they told us that ultimately, uh, they told us one more thing here, and we're going to take this down. They told us that there's regulation, ladies and gentlemen. There's some sort of regulation uh, between hackers that prevents them from garnering public support. Because if they don't garner public support, they'll be ineffective. Guys, hackers don't work on public support. The reason why mass protests require public support is because they need people on the ground to show that there's some sort of mass involved, that people support these calls. Hackers don't need that because hackers already have all the tools of political protest at their disposal, ladies and gentlemen. So they don't need political support, which is the reason why systemically in status quo, there have been hacks of hospitals that have killed lives, there have been hacks of troop movements that have killed lives, and we tell you this is ultimately unjustified. The checks and balances on their side simply doesn't work. Secondly, are these uh, social, uh, hold on a moment, sir. Are these uh, uh, hacktivism efforts effective? Before that, yes, sir. All these situations aren't situations of hacktivism. The other people are just hacking to be destructive. That's different. Hacktivism has a purpose, it has accountability attached to it. Okay, let's give you an example of Anonymous that they use so well, right? They told us that Anonymous has a political cause. Guys, their political cause is that they hate capitalism. Capitalism. Their cause of action, ladies and gentlemen, was to hack Sony's PSN system and link 200,000 uh, credit card codes into the public sphere. So if they, they did have a political cause, but does that make a political cause legitimate, ladies and gentlemen? No, it's precisely because of the irregulation in, uh, of hacktivism that any political cause becomes somehow legitimate on their side. We don't support that, ladies and gentlemen. Then they told us, and this is the last thing they told us, was that it's more effective than normal movements because ultimately these people are anonymous. It's precisely because these people are anonymous that it becomes more dangerous because they can do whatever they want and get away with it. We don't support a system where hackers can hack something and get away with it. We don't support a system where a criminal can rob someone and get away with it. Why do we support hacktivism, ladies and gentlemen? They never dealt with an analysis presented on outside of the house. Moving on to my argument about how we dehumanize process, uh, 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 protests, and this directly clashes with their uh, argument about social mobility. We begin with the premise that support for movements always build themselves on human stories. The reason why people have sympathy for the woman in Egypt protesting for her freedom is because it's a human story. That's why the human protester was Time's Person of the Year in 2012 instead of Anonymous. Because the reason why we believe in, uh, and support our friends in countries that are protesting is because we can empathize with our fellow men. Occupy Wall Street was so important because it was a mass movement of people and not one person behind a computer screen that tried to hack into Goldman Sachs. Political protests are meant to galvanize the population, to make them believe in a cause that people 
uh, believe and know they are, that it's worth fighting with sweat and tears for. The problem with groups like Anonymous and the problem with groups like that they raise is that they don't need this support, which means that the political protests themselves ultimately don't garner the sort of mass support that their side uh, actually wants to have. So the problem with hacktivism is that it does not create the same sort of sympathy or empathy for the victims. Because these hacktivists also, ladies and gentlemen, use of the illegitimate means to achieve their goals. So ultimately, this trivializes the suffering of those with legitimate political causes and creates a, 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 blur, a blurry line between different causes that results in the same uh, uh, destruction of infrastructure, ladies and gentlemen. So therefore, it doesn't matter whether you're protesting capitalism or protesting ecology, ladies and gentlemen, you all result in the same means and it's the same sort of destruction that is caused. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, the cause that hacktivism fight for will never have the means to garner support, despite the entire purpose for political protest being to garner support. This makes these movements always ineffective, causing more harm and therefore being illegitimate, ladies and gentlemen. So, what, what is, what, let's give you an example, ladies and gentlemen. Greenpeace. Greenpeace is an eco-terrorist eco group, right? They have a legitimate cause. They want to protect their environment. They're, they're now resulting in things like cyber terrorism. What are they doing? They're developing a virus that hacks into a nuclear power plant and ultimately result in the destruction of the nuclear power plant, possibly causing severe radioactive like uh, uh, um, damage in Iran, ladies and gentlemen. That's not what we want to support because it causes the lives of so many people. So hacktivism, ladies and gentlemen, is basically cyber terrorism with a political cause. The political label doesn't mean this, the, the, the action and the means by which they, they, they purport their ideas are legitimate. For all these reasons, go with opposition. Welcome the third speaker on the government side to deliver the rebuttal. to expose that, that's when you're doing hacktivism. We didn't really hear a response to that. 
On that note, we think that they've largely misunderstood the idea of hacktivism, right? They've told you that any type of hacking is simply, you know, really, really violent and it's simply not justifiable. We told you that they're grossly exaggerating this, right? We do respect that in some cases, hacktivism can be used in negative ways. We tell you on the whole, it can be used for positive ways. Furthermore, what we tell you is we're debating the principle of hacktivism itself, right? We're not debating Point. whether or not if I hack into a government system and then use that information in a horrible way, that is a justifiable tool because the tool was the hacking itself. I just wouldn't be a responsible actor. What we tell you is that it's perfectly legitimate to override your government's secrecy when they're hiding things from you that harm you Point. and when they're doing things improperly that's harming your society, right? We think that's the fundamental difference that they failed to uh, recognize. And then they give you this example of Estonia where someone hacked in to highlight medical expenses and expose credit card information. We tell you that this is a perfect example of where people didn't use it responsibly because the thing is, if the credit card Man. If the credit card information hadn't been included on the leaked documents, it would have been a perfectly acceptable act of hacktivism because the hacking was done to highlight the fact that their medical system is irresponsible and is charging Point. too much, right? We think that's an issue with the hackers themselves, not the act of hack hacktivism. In the same way that a protest can be great until it turns into a mob, hacktivism is great until you get someone who doesn't know how to use it in a good way, right? We think that that's all totally true. No, thank you. The final idea that they brought up to us was this point about anonymity and not ah, anonymity. And they told you that basically people can get away with things and be destructive, and that's really, really bad. They didn't actually give us any analysis as to why people want to be destructive. Because you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, as an individual, if I was a hacker, my goal wouldn't be to harm my country, right? Obviously, this is a form of political protest where you actually want to improve conditions, right? Any harm that you're perpetuating Point. in a good situation would be, actually, I'll take you in a moment, would be in order to improve the conditions, right? Yes. Trying to ban capitalism or destroy nuclear energy are legitimate social causes. Does that make the means by which you try and forward these okay, aims legitimate? You. We would tell you, let's just, since they're talking about the little Greenpeace here, example here where they melted down a nuclear reactor, let's look at the user here. Greenpeace, like, kills fishing boats. They sink them. They do all sorts of irresponsible things. They try to stop oil tankers. They cause huge messes in trying to stop them, right? We think Greenpeace is a perfect example of an irresponsible user. We think a different version would have been instead of melting a nuclear reactor, simply stopping it to prove, hey, look, we can, and we don't agree with what you're doing, right? We think it's the user, not the act itself, and it can be used in great political momentum. Okay, so now that we've gone into that, let's get into this idea of uses. And we ultimately told you it is effective because you can get into the system and you can access the information. They didn't really have a problem with that. They conceded that, yes, you're getting the information. They had a problem with what you're doing with the information. We think that's not really their burden, right? We think we just need to prove that the information itself could be used effectively and the act itself is an effective thing, right? No, thank you. If I'm protesting about high bus fares when my city is charging five cents for bus fares, like, it's an effective, like, it's not an effective use of that protest, but a protest is still an effective means of protesting, like marching, right? We think that ultimately it does depend on how you use it. Okay, so then what they actually tried to tell you about this idea of uses was they brought up this point that was kind of a bunch of alternatives, and they told you that, you know, things are really, really harmful, and you need to prove why this is the best option. False, ladies and gentlemen. We need to prove why this is an option. We don't need to prove that this is the best, we need to prove that in some situations this can be really, really, really helpful. Okay, no, thank you. So with that, let's look at what we have to do under this. Okay, so they tried to tell you that when you go on the ground, that's a way better situation. And what we tell you is it's actually not. Because the principal difference between a ground movement and a hacktivist movement is the hacktivist movement can be stopped. Because once you're in a co engaged combat on the ground, or once you've started marching and it turns into a mob, or once you've gotten into a negative situation, you're physically there and people are physically restraining you there. We think that they give you an example of a medical emergency where people could simply walk out of the way. No, we tell you that the mob is now in the way of like the hospital or ambulance getting to the point. We we think that if you had a national emergency and the hacktivists had shut down a system, they would realize that and it's like that, now it's not a problem anymore. The government now knows that they have that weakness, which is great because now we have more awareness about privacy, but we think it's something that's easily reversible. We think that that's why you har cause more harm on the ground. Furthermore, we tell you that ultimately they can't just say hacktivism is more harmful than ground work because we've seen a lot of really violent things happening on the ground. They didn't analyze why hack like the groundwork wasn't harmful. Furthermore, once again, they didn't give you analysis on why hacktivists want to be destructive. Destructive. They asserted that people are. They asserted that anonymity allows you to be destructive, but they didn't actually add analysis for why these social movement people who are trying to improve society want to destruct Point. things. Right? We think they're trying to do it in the least destructive way possible. Okay. Finally, they told you instead, let's just enact some policies. 
We tell you once again, you can't enact policies on things that you don't know are happening. In order to have an effective movement that's going to grab attention, you're going to need to tell people what's going on, and you're going to need a legitimate source. That brings me to my next point that Dasha so brilliantly explained. So we talk about this idea of social mobility, and Dasha had three examples under this. She talked to you first about how it's an increased legitimacy of the information, second about how it's non-viable so there's more support, and third about how it's easily viewed because it's spread online. We didn't actually hear any adequate response, or really any response at all from side opposition about this idea about non-violence being more supportive and about how it's easily viewed because it's done online and because it spreads virally. What we did kind of hear a response to was this idea that, you know, it's not increased legitimacy of information that's effective, it's empathy. We tell you two very different situations apply. If I'm protesting against something very, very technical, I can't get up and be like, yes, my like statistical and uh, like analytical problems here. Like there's all this scientific facts. The government is doing this and this with coding. You have to feel pity for me. No, that's not how it works. I need evidence that says, look at this coding that the government is doing wrong, right? Furthermore, in the cases where they do think it a uh, head figure that you can empathize with is useful, we tell you, why can't you use hacktivism as well, right? It's not just a case of hacktivism or a case of having a leader. You can use hacktivism in conjunction with the leader. Finally, we tell you, you can't get your leader out there unless they're propagating something, unless they're saying that something is wrong, we think hacktivism is the best way of providing that information in a lot of cases. Okay, finally we heard this basic idea of mobilization. We told you that you need people on the, they told you that you need people on the ground for mobilization. Our simple response is yes, people on the ground can be good for mobilization, but hacktivism can mobilize people who aren't physically there in that country, in that now. That's why you can reach more people, that's why you can spread the word, that's why you can have an effect, and it's because side opposition fundamentally understood the principle of today's debate as a tool, not an end. We beg to propose. Thank you very much for the speech. Now I would like to welcome the third speaker on the opposition side to deliver their rebuttal. They, they, that's why they, they, uh, they advocate for destructive causes, because they don't need the mass of 
support that is required in a political movement, so that the so the political movement seems legitimate and presents a legitimate front to the people. Instead, of in things like anonymous, all they do is hack into systems because they can, because they want to follow their own anti-capitalist agendas that are systemically unregulated by their side. Then they tell us about how anonymous hacking credit cards has no political purposes. We told them that that is anti-capitalism as their political purpose. They later conceded to us by defending anonymous as a community. So this means that anonymous must be in discussion in this debate. That means that we are the side that's much more realistic and grounded in what exactly happens. Instead, they haven't given you a single example of this benign hacktivism that they talked about. We gave, we filled in the blanks for them with Julian Assange, and we tell you that Julian Assange almost caused the war between Turkey and the USA, never responded to by their side. Second question on whether this is principally right. We think that down the line, they started to lose the nuance of the motion, the of political protest, of how a political protest is one that has a combined cause and is supposed to have a new vision for society if they're going to overthrow the government. We tell you that hackers systemically don't have those kinds of notions. Yes. Ma'am, you've told us that they don't need political support, but if they expect to change anything, don't they need popular support? Ergo, will not do bad things? That's why we tell you that hackers don't want to change anything. All they want to do is be destructive. They are basically mavericks who stand behind the computers and want to press a button just so that they can destroy people. That's how power hungry they are. That's what Anonymous is driven by. They need to contend with this. So, furthermore, that principle ultimately was pure and absolute information for the people. They tell us that hacktivism breaks down government walls and security systems. But then we gave them the question, then why do we have security systems in the first place? Why doesn't the government tell people everything? Uh, why doesn't the government tell people everything? Because uh, uh, considering that they're a democratic government, so they do have an incentive to remain transparent to the people, otherwise they will be voted out, ladies and gentlemen. That means that when a government isn't transparent, they are, tra they are not transparent for very important reasons, such as national security. We gave you the example of Julian Assange, never taken down by their side. We further give you the example of Anonymous, which hacked into the US Department of Defense, leaving the Pentagon defenseless from terrorist attacks. They don't have a, the alternative vision for society. All they want to do is take down the US government because they are a group of disgruntled people who don't care what happens after they take over. Next contention, or whether it's practically effective. They told us that exposing nuclear codes is not a social cause and is not, therefore, uh, hacktivism. But we tell you that nuclear codes are information and if their side stands for an absolute right to information, then exposing nuclear codes must be some form of political protest, right, ladies and gentlemen? So therefore, hacktivism, even for exposing nuclear codes, would be a political protest. So this was the only attack to everything our, 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 our first two speakers told you about, about how exposing nuclear codes causes nuclear meltdowns so that people are exploded on by nuclear weapons, right? And, we, and, and furthermore, we, talk, we even told you about the example of Estonia, where hospitals were unable to access their systems that told us about patients' medical records, such as their blood types, so that we couldn't so that we couldn't save the people who were crashed in car accidents and who needed blood transfusions urgently. They never responded on those counts. So, furthermore, they told us that as long as people are protesting something technical, they'll need to gain evidence through hacking. We tell you the reason why they know where to hack in the first place is that they know that something is wrong. So this implies that there are other sources of information that they can turn to and already have turned to. That means that hacktivism is unnecessary. Their own case defeats itself, ladies and gentlemen. So we give you an, uh, an example of an alternative source of information. How about interviews with the people who are actually suffering from the problems that they're they are, that they are campaigning for in political protests? How about the media attention on the causes that they actually want to support? These are the kinds of things that bring political protest about and that galvanize people on the ground, which we think is a much more credible and legitimate force of political protest. Yes. Ma'am, do you really think the government's going to go up to a news reporter that's covering the situation and be like, yes, we do these horrible things, why don't we tell you about it? You've, not, you've never responded to the nuance of this argument, which is that when we have media attention, we galvanize the people on the ground so that they actually turn the, turn the government over or create an alternative vision of society. However, hacktivism remains behind its computer screens and doesn't find uh, any political support from the people and therefore doesn't bring about any political change, never responded to by their side. So therefore, the next thing they told us is that hacktivism is easier to deal with with protesters. 
However, this is untrue because hacktivism is never used as a substitute for protest on the ground. If hacktivists are going to hack, they are not going to become political protesters on the ground. Instead, however, they are going to drive away the focus from, from hacktivism. Uh, they are going to drive away the focus from the actual causes that political protests are, are bringing about on the ground to the hacktivism that is happening, even though these are mavericks. Even though all this hacktivism that is happening is just systemically unregulated and damaging to civilians. So we tell you that the hacktivism they talk about has no benefit whatsoever. The last thing they told us is about how Greenpeace is an example of an irresponsible user. But exactly right, ladies and gentlemen, exactly. Because in every case, we think hacktivism systemically leads to irresponsible use because there's no checks in their system and they've never attempted to place any checks on it. In fact, in legitimizing it, they're going to open the floodgates to more hacktivism and hacktivism of all types and forms. That means that hacktivism is going to be so much more abused on their side. We give you the example of Anonymous. How, how, how it started to hack into Singapore's Ministry of Family and Social Development even though the ministry had done nothing to them. Even if they are responsible in a user, we told you how this is wrong because they are still re revealing sensitive information that the government should have control over. Therefore, go on our side, the side that was more realistic and beneficial. Thank you very much for the speech. Now I would like to welcome the opposition's reply speaker to conclude the debate for their side. Chemical weapons. They can be used responsibly, they can be used effectively, and they can be used to overthrow a government. Does that make chemical weapons legitimate? No, it does not. What the other side has failed to prove down three speakers was why just because something can be used uh, acceptably in some cases makes the tool legitimate. We argued that there has always been some sort of systemic problem with hacktivism that has made it illegitimate and they've never dealt with the nuance of our arguments. Two contentions. First, the right to hack. And second, will they hack responsibly and what happens when they don't. First, the right to hack. The main thrust of their case was one example, Wikileaks. They told us that Wikileaks provided an objective good to society because we revealed, we revealed information that would have otherwise not been revealed. First of all, we told, uh, first of all, we already argued that this information, if needed, could have been revealed through other sources. So this was not a unique benefit to their side. But more importantly, we told you that this information wasn't needed in the first place and caused objective harm to society. When we talked about Wikileaks, we talked about Turkey almost starting a war with the United States. We talked about putting our soldiers in danger because troop movements are now on the internet for terrorists to see. No response from their side, ladies and gentlemen. We argued that Wikileaks was an objectively harmful thing to society and they never dealt with the nuance of this point. So therefore, we've already taken down the logic that there is a right to hack because we argue down the line on our side that even if your ends are legitimate, if the means by which you achieve your ends are illegitimate, that doesn't make these means legitimate. Second contention, will they hack responsibly? What happens when they don't? The first thing they try to characterize these people as are good Samaritans. They hack to tell the government what's wrong with your system, ladies and gentlemen. That's not why they hack a government system. We gave you an alternative to this. We told you that governments employ people all the time to find loopholes in their system. So they didn't need hack hacktivists, ladies and gentlemen. They really don't need hacktivists because they already have people in there trying to find loopholes in your government system to begin with. But then we argue that for every national defense breach that a hacktivist managed to figure out, this, these are precious minutes where terrorist groups can infiltrate this system and cause massive harm to your national security. No response from the other side. The last thing they really had was the idea that, well, there are going to be regulations. Why are there going to be regulations? Because these people need political support and political like, movements. First of all, we told you that the reason why some groups need political support is because they are on the ground movements that look much better and garner international recognition 
if they are on the ground and it is a mass group on the ground. Anonymous and hacktivists don't need this because their aims are fundamentally destructive and not constructive. You don't need 10,000 people to, uh, to be destructive, ladies and gentlemen. You only need one that can hack into one system, one bank, and cause billions of dollars of losses. So you don't need the sort of mass support on their side. Their argument didn't hold any weight. But then we told you about all these systemic problems with hacktivism that makes this unregulation problematic. We talked to you about the sort of massive harm they'll cause when they start to destroy nuclear power plants, when they start to deny hospitals access to records of their patients so that when a person needs a blood transfusion, we don't know which blood type to give them and we cause their deaths. Ladies and gentlemen, we told you this all the time. We don't need hacktivism. Hacktivism has brought us far more harm than good. Hacktivism is the reason why our society will be in shambles if we can allow hacktivism to continue. Go with opposition. Thank you very much for the speech. Now, finally, I would like to welcome the government's reply speaker to conclude this debate for us. Of the 
But once you take that money for your own selfish interest, it is no longer hacktivism. That does not count in this debate. They've never made that distinction. But furthermore, we, we actually debunked all their examples by telling you that they do need public support because ultimately it comes down to change. They didn't respond to that. They only gave you a circular argument. So ultimately, what did we tell you in prop in terms of leading to better protests? We would tell you that this doesn't actually hurt people physically in a sense because that the point that it does is not hacktivism. But furthermore, the most important thing is getting awareness. Because once you have awareness, once you have social mobilization, that's when people can make up their minds about whether something is illegitimate or not. If it's illegitimate, the protest just won't be successful. The movement won't spread. We don't treat it with respect and trust. Ultimately, take away a few things from our safe house. First off, the people have a right to know and hold their government accountable. Whether or not it's effective, they have this right. But most importantly, on our side of the house, you need to know to react. Once you have the information, it's up to the people. We're defending the tool today. And that's why we won this debate on our side of the house.